exciting and thrilling moments in week four of the 2022 NFL season, but that has come to an end. Now we close the chapter on that, and now we preview week five of the 2022 NFL season. In this episode of Time of Football, we're going to be talking about two teams that might be two and two and one and three, but don't be so pessimistic on them because their season isn't over if we look ahead at their schedule. And they might surprise you later on down the stretch. We're a quarter of the way through the season as well. So we're going to talk about our quarter season MVP favorites thus far, as well as Kenny Pickett's emergence as the starting quarterback of the Pittsburgh Steelers on a brand new episode of Time to Football. Glad you guys were able to come across this video. My name is Hassan Khan, the host of this wonderful channel that we like to call Time to Football. I'm glad you guys were able to come across this video, the uh, two to three of you that are watching this video. Man, it's it's brutal. It's brutal out there. For you guys that don't know what happened, and the story behind it is we completely cut fantasy football from this channel, and people were subscribing because of fantasy football. Uh, for you guys that wondered where the Starts and Sits videos go, the fantasy football, if you comment that, I just delete the comments because I don't want any fantasy football talk on this channel. Uh, so I explained it 15 or 20 different times in posts uh, and videos. Like, just go to the community tab in this channel, and you'll figure out what happened to fantasy football. The way I put it, too, is I, I make might make a video talking about this, but uh, I've interviewed some big names, man. I've interviewed uh, George Kittle, Tyreek Hill, Antonio Brown as well, Chris Godwin, like after they won the Super Bowl and everything, but people don't know that. And people don't know that because people were just watching fantasy football on this channel and not the other stuff. But we completely cut it and we expect a drop in viewership, like only 200, 300 views per video. Uh, we expect 1,000 to 2,000 subscribers less because everybody was just subscribing for fantasy football. Um, but we expect that. So it's going to be a little bit of a grind for the next year. But that's okay. Like we're trying to bring in a new audience that cares about the NFL. But we still have fantasy football content coming out. Different channel. Um but anyways, let's get into this episode of Time to Football. Uh, let's first start off with the injury roundup. Talk about the biggest names that might be missing some time moving forward. Javante Williams, that's the biggest news. That's the saddest news as he has torn his ACL. I think it's LCL as well per Adam Schefter. He's going to be out for the remainder of the season. Melvin Gordon would step in as the RB1. They also signed Latavius Murray off the practice squad for the New Orleans Saints. And then Mike Boone uh, is going to be utilized as well in the Denver backfield. Dak Prescott had that thumb injury, had surgery. Now he's getting an opinion by the time that this video is filmed. And it comes out every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, by the way, this NFL podcast, weekly podcast. Um, by the time this video is filmed, though, Dak Prescott hasn't gotten his opinion yet. So we don't know if he's going to be playing against the LA Rams, but he has not been practicing as of right now. So more than likely, he's probably going to be missing this week, I would assume, and hit, and then he'll be ready for week six, but we'll we'll just have to wait and see the progress on Dak Prescott. Tua Tukavailoa has already been ruled out. After the uh, whole mishap that happened with him getting a concussion in the Buffalo Bills game, and then again, having that uh, horrific injury against the Cincinnati Bengals, he's already been ruled out. I think for someone to be ruled out this early, it's it's more of a media thing. Like, they're just trying to save some grace for the Dolphins. They're just, like, you know, trying to look good. And, I mean, I, I do think that they do care about Tua Tukavailoa. They let go of the, the person that had the uh, decision to clear Tukavailoa. But uh, for him to get ruled out this early and Teddy Bridgewater to be the starting quarterback, it, again, it's just saving grace for the media at this point. Uh, Cordero Patterson has been placed on injured reserve due to a knee procedure that he had to have, was taken out of the game. Caleb Huntley came in, looked great. Tyler Algier came in, looked great. Those are going to be the top two guys moving forward uh, for the next four weeks at least. Jonathan Taylor had a little bit of a scare with his ankle, but he came back negative in the results with his test. So there is a chance that he does play this Thursday night against the Denver Broncos. Daniel Jones suffered an ankle injury as well after his two rollout touchdowns against the Chicago Bears that they seemingly could not seem to stop at all. Uh, Daniel Jones is going to be day-to-day -day moving forward. Shaquille Leonard, formerly known as Darius Leonard, has been ruled out versus the Denver Broncos due to a concussion. And Randy Gregory will miss two to six weeks for the Denver Broncos after having surgery on his knee. And that is your injury updates for this week. So let's get started with today's topics. Kenny Pickett came in and relieved Mitch Trubisky, much like DK Metcalf relieving himself being carted to the locker room against the Lions. 
Kenny Pickett came in and gave a spark for this Pittsburgh Steelers team, and they almost beat the New York Jets. Is Kenny Pickett the better option for the Steelers moving forward over Mitch Trubisky? Taking a look at his performance this past Sunday against the Jets, 10 out of 13 of his passes completed, great completion percentage, zero touchdowns, three interceptions. That's not the best, but we'll talk about that in, in just a bit. And two rushing touchdowns. Kind of kept the Steelers in the game with his goal line QB sneaks. But is Kenny Pickett the better option for Trubisky? Well, his three interceptions, I will say, one, it's his rook, it's his rookie year. It's his first game. Like, give him some slack. Cut the man a break. And one of those interceptions, I will say, was to Chase Claypool. It was a great pass. I don't want to say perfect pass, but it was a great pass that Chase Claypool, catch radius, should have been good enough to catch the ball off his hands into the Jets' defensive back's hands, and uh, that ended up being an interception. So Pickett moving forward, though, what I did see in his performance for the Steelers is he likes to throw that ball deep. And this is the best game that George Pickens has had so far in his career. A lot of people thought, man, the way that Pickens is playing in the preseason, he was looking good. And now he kind of went off with Kenny Pickett as a quarterback, six receptions, 102 yards. And that's because Kenny Pickett throws it deep. That pass to Chase Claypool, that was intercepted. I mean, Claypool could have had some pretty good receiving yards in this game if it weren't for his drop pass. Deontay Johnson, don't quote me on this, but I think there was a deep pass towards the back of the end zone from Kenny Pickett. It might have been from Mitch Trubisky. I could be wrong, but I believe it was from Kenny Pickett. So for a guy going into his first NFL game and completing or at least attempting all these passes deep, I like it a lot. Like he's taking shots and he's trying to get better and and trying to utilize this Pittsburgh Steelers receiving core the way that they should be utilized. And I think it is better for the Pittsburgh Steelers moving forward because the way that Pickens has been playing in preseason, guess what? A lot of his great performances came from Kenny Pickett being the quarterback in preseason, throwing him the ball. Chase Claypool has been almost a non-factor with Mitch Trubisky. Had he caught that catch, would have been a factor. Deontay Johnson, you know, two receptions this past weekend for 11 yards, not the greatest, but maybe with Kenny Pickett under center, develop a little bit more chemistry, could be the safe like five to 10 reception kind of guy every game moving forward. Like I like it a lot. And then Pat Frymuth as well, like against the Jets, you you may not believe it, but the Jets are pretty good against tight ends and stopping them underneath had seven receptions for 85 yards. So Kenny Pickett is looking pretty decent as of right now. I will say this has, this is very, very intellectual by the Pittsburgh Steelers. For them to sign Mitch Trubisky knowing that they're going to be drafting Kenny Pickett a little bit later on. Because if you look at the contract situation and the financials of it, it was reported that he signed a two-year, $27 million deal. Trubisky did for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And you're thinking to yourself, oh, that's a little bit of money for a guy that's a bridge quarterback that you don't know is going to be your starting quarterback moving forward. But only $14 million of that twenty-seven million was guaranteed. That means $13 million came from incentives. And if Kenny Pickett was named the starter this early on, those incentives, they saved that $13 million. Now, moving forward, pre-June 1st, before June 1st, you can trade him, you can cut him, and you only take a $2.6 million cap hit on the cap space. They knew what they were doing. If they hold on to Trubisky moving forward, and then you release him after that June 1st date, and trade him after the June 1st date, then you're going to pay a little bit more money. But a decision is going to be made on Trubisky. He's not going to be in Pittsburgh more than likely uh, in 2023. So the Steelers were very, very smart with a contract with Mitch Trubisky, knowing that they're going to be drafting Kenny Pickett a little bit later on. But to pretty much sum it up, man, I, I like Pickett. I like Pickett. I love, I just keep going back to the fact that he was just attempting deep passes. He was looking George Pickens' way. That's something that the Steelers fans wanted for so long. Hopefully, Najee Harris, like this may open things up for Najee Harris, who hasn't been looking the best. But, you know, you can't be too sure about that. That offensive line needs some help as well. Uh, But moving forward, this is a great decision. This is a great decision by the Steelers because a lot of talk has been made or, or talked about, oh, it's best for the quarterback to sit and wait and learn your rookie season. I've talked about for two years, three years, four years on this channel, like, it, it, there's no, there's no data statistics to really back that up. Like it's actually proven in the favor of if you start a majority of your games 
your rookie season, then moving forward, you're actually going to have a better career rather than just sitting and waiting. There are exceptions. I get it. Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes. I get that. But those are like the only two. Like uh, Trevor Lawrence is having a decent year this season. He played all his games last year as well. Uh, Derek Carr played all his games his rookie season. Like there's just multiple examples on top of examples of players playing all 16 games and they move on to have pretty good careers. Leave your comments down below. I want to hear your thoughts on Kenny Pickett being the Pittsburgh Steelers quarterback. Do you think that he's going to be successful this Sunday against the Bills? It's going to be a little bit tough. I don't think so. I don't think he's going to have the best game. Bills defense, man, Sean McDermott on the other hand, this is just random, but Sean McDermott, like if you don't have your cornerback one, cornerback two, safety one, it doesn't matter. Like it's just kind of like a plug and play kind of defense. They have success no matter what. Like I I just want to give him props on the defense that, that he creates in there. Uh, I guess more so to Leslie Frazier, uh, the defensive coordinator. But still, uh, yeah, we don't expect a great performance from Kenny Pickett. And we have very low expectations. But, I mean, he can get things going with his legs. So uh, leave your comments down below. I want to hear your thoughts. Like, Kenny Pickett, is going to be a successful quarterback for his career? Maybe the season? And for the Pittsburgh Steers and what this means for them moving forward, are they a playoff contender this season? Or do you think that, hey, let's just see what we got. We kind of need to rebuild right now. But moving forward next season, I think we're going to be in a better spot. Leave your comments down below. I would love to interact with every single one of you. Moving on to the next topic, I want to take a moment to talk about some quarter season MVP favorites because we're a quarter of the way through, I guess, technically. I mean, there's 17 games in a regular season. There's, I don't know. I can't, whatever. the Whatever the math is, four games through, usually in the past, this would be a quarter way through, but... 17 game season, four games down. Who are three MVP candidates at this point? I've always just preached on this channel that this is a quarterback award for some freaking reason, and it shouldn't be. Like Cooper Cup should have been the MVP last year. Aaron Rodgers being the MVP, like it was a historic season by a wide receiver versus just another great season by a quarterback. Like, like, why is it get, I, whatever. Anyways, anyways, I don't like giving quarterbacks awards, uh, the MVP award, unless they absolutely definitely deserved it. But so far, quarter way through the season, there's only three quarterbacks or three players that I could really talk about, and they're all quarterbacks. Uh, so I'm going to mention from who I feel like is like the least favorite out of the three to like the most favorite out of the three. So starting with Option number three, you've got Lamar Jackson. Uh, 11 passing touchdowns, four interceptions, 65% of his passes completed. And, and he ran for another 316 yards, another nice stone cold amount of yardage, and two rushing touchdowns. I do feel like he is in the MVP conversation. Now, the only reason why I have him at number three, even though he's individually performing really, really well, it's because the Ravens are 2-2. Two and two. A lot of that has to do with the defense, and it's not the best in the NFL. But Jackson makes up for it on offense and has really proven and, and bet on himself and really does deserve a long-term contract uh, moving forward. Now, this is just an individual type performance. I think whenever people vote for the MVP, they look at how far the team is getting. I know it's a before the playoff uh, or the postseason begins, but they still look at individual statistics and performance as well as how good were you for your team? And did you do anything for your team? And Lamar Jackson, like with them again being two and two, it's it's kind of kind of hurts his uh chances of winning MVP. But he has option number three for me. Uh option number two, I have Jalen Hurts. Oh my gosh, what a season this guy's having. 1,120 yards passing, four passing touchdowns, two interceptions, and then on the ground, another 200 rushing yards and four rushing touchdowns. But I think the biggest factor with him is you look at those numbers, it's like, okay, that's not as good as Lamar Jackson and the individual standpoint, but look at the Eagles and where they are, 4-0. and And it's a lot of it has to, do, it has to be accredited to Jalen Hurts, who worked his butt off for the last two years to be in this position to be the starting quarterback for the Eagles. And the passing game was the biggest knock on him. And he said, okay, you know what? I'm going to spend this offseason working on the passing game. And he did exactly that. And now he is an MVP favorite. I like it a lot with A.J. Brown there. Devonta Smith to help his numbers out as well. 
Jalen Hurts would be my option number two as an MVP favorite. And then option number one. So, okay, we talked about individual performance for Lamar Jackson, but not team success. We talked about team success for Jalen Hurts, but not individual performance. How about someone that's a combination of both team success and individual performance? And that is Josh Allen. 10 touchdowns, three interceptions, 1,227 yards passing. That's either, I think that's like top three in the NFL currently. Uh, 67.3% of his passes completed, what, 183 rushing yards and two rushing touchdowns on top of that as well. And then you look at the Buffalo Bills. People are talking about they're one of, if not the best team in the NFL. I know they had one loss against the Miami Dolphins, but they could easily be 4-0 at this point. And a lot of it is because of Josh Allen, like, for the last couple of years, this run game hasn't really helped him out too much. So he's been having to do a lot. And, and just carrying the team as well and keeping them alive in that game, that 21-19 to 19 loss against the Miami Dolphins, like it speaks for himself. Like he touched the ball 70, 75 times or something like that, and he kept them in the game. And he, he is the most valuable player for the Buffalo Bills. And in the NFL, I feel like if the season were to end today, Josh Allen would be the NFL MVP. But those are my three options. One, Josh Allen. Two, Jalen Hurts. Three, Lamar Jackson. Leave a comment down below. I'd love to interact with you. If you have another MVP favorite, I'd love to talk to you. My preseason MVP uh, candidates were Justin Jefferson and uh, Justin Herbert. I mean, both of them are having some pretty good seasons. But like these three guys right here are, are definitely uh, above and beyond any one of those guys. So leave a comment down below. I'd love to interact with you. Now, the next topic, which teams could turn it around moving forward? So uh, there are some teams that are two and two and one of three that maybe we had higher expectations for them, but they haven't been delivering on their promise. And I wanted to look at those teams and really think about, hey, can, can they turn their season around? Is there a chance for them to make the postseason eventually move it forward? And we saw two teams that after looking at their schedule, we're like, oh, without a doubt, like this is going to be pretty, I don't want to say easy because there's nothing easy that comes to you in the NFL, but it'll be better as far as, or, or compared to other schedules moving forward for other teams. So the first team that I want to talk about is the Baltimore Ravens, currently two and two. But if you look at their schedule, they have no team left on their schedule above 500. Let me repeat that because I don't think that sunk in for a lot of people. No team left to face above 500. Every team that they have remaining on their schedule is either 2-2 two two or below. Now, they have some tough matchups, I will say. Like the toughest matchups, only three matchups. Two against the Cincinnati Bengals, one against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. All They're all 2-2, two two, but it's still difficult. And they have some other you know, kind of difficult matchups, like maybe a tier below, like the Jaguars, the Browns a couple of times. But, you know, like I said, it's a tier below the Bucks and the Bengals. Like, th so those are just three matchups that they could potentially lose. But what does that put you at? Five losses for the season? Everything else, maybe you have a mishap against the Browns, like you split the series. Like, you have a good chance of finishing 10-7 and seven minimum with the Baltimore Ravens. The Ravens' defense has been their Achilles heel, their secondary especially. But hopefully it can hold off enough. Looking at the schedule, moving forward, could potentially be AFC North champions. This Sunday night against the Bengals will tell us all. It's early, it's only week five, but if they beat the Bengals, I'm going to go ahead and say, like, yes, the Ravens are going to be AFC North champions. Because even if you split with the Bengals, like, you show that you're more dominant, you show that you can hold off the Bengals, like, you have a chance. I'm going to say that they are going to be AFC North champions if they can beat the Cincinnati Bengals this weekend. So the Bengals or, or the Ravens, their schedule, love it. Love it, love it, love it. Again, I don't see anything less than 10-7 and 7 for this team. And the way that Lamar Jackson is playing as well, guys, like this Ravens team, nothing to worry about. Don't be pessimistic about them. They're going to be uh, fine moving forward. The next team, this might surprise some people. Because it's kind of riddled with some injuries, but I'm going to say the New England Patriots, one and three currently. But again, looking at the schedule, weeks five through ten, they have some pretty decent matchups: the Lions, Browns, Bears, Jets, Colts, and then after their bye week, 
the Jets. These are teams that they could easily beat. Six teams that they have a chance of beating. If they do, they could be seven and three. You have a mishap against one, six and four. Mishap against two, uh, five and five. Like they're going to turn their season around and they're going to be back in the wild card conversation after this six to seven week stretch. The Patriots, uh, hopefully Mac Jones can come back sooner rather than later because they got some pretty good matchups and they they definitely need them moving forward. So uh, I like the Patriots to turn their season around later in the season. I don't know, but I'm going to say that they're going to be in the conversation again for a wild card spot. So the Ravens and the Patriots are my two teams that I feel like, hey, it's not looking good right now, but eventually they're going to turn it around. It's going to get better for them. To wrap up this episode of Town of Football, let's go ahead and preview week five. And by doing that, we want to talk about a couple of teams that actually might pull off an upset. We do this every week. And last week, yours truly said that the San Francisco 49ers would beat the LA Rams. So can we pull it off again? Can we go two for two? Like, which team this week has a chance at pulling off an upset? Well, I looked through it. There are two teams that I was like, ah, oh, maybe these teams actually have a chance. Uh, okay. The New York Jets, I would assume that the Jets, I haven't looked at point spreads yet, but I would assume that the Jets are the underdog because the Dolphins are three and one. And for you guys that, you know, are watching this and you're like, well, technically, the Dolphins are the underdog in this game because there's a point spread of minus 3.5. You know, it's like, okay, like, I haven't. I haven't looked at the point spreads yet or the favorites yet. So I'm just assuming that the Jets are the underdog. And I'm going to say that the Jets have a chance at beating the Miami Dolphins. Like Zach Wilson coming back did not get two interceptions, but he didn't look terrible in that game against the Steelers. Like, you know, he kept them alive, came back, game-winning drive. I think the Jets offense, like we got to give them a little bit more credit as compared to last season. Like they're doing good. They're doing decent. Like with Joe Flacco, he was a good complimentary piece, and now he's out. Zach Wilson is in. I think they pick up right where they left off. Brees Hall has emerged as the number one uh, running back, and that Miami Dolphins team, like with that two and took of Iloa, the offense is going to struggle a bit. According to Tyreek Hill, it's not. He can put up numbers with me, with you. It doesn't matter who's throwing him the ball. Tyreek Hill can do really, really well. Now, I'm not going to doubt Teddy Bridgewater. I think they're, they're going to have a pretty decent game. But I am going to say if there is a team that is going to keep it close, that is technically the underdog, like without Tua Tagovailoa, this might be the week that the Jets could actually compete with the Miami Dolphins. Just got to get past the defense. But I I feel that they have a chance at beating the Dolphins. Uh, The next team, and you actually might be surprised, but the Houston Texans against the Jacksonville Jaguars, 0-3-1. It is not looking good for the Texans. Hey, could Lovey Smith be fired? <laughs> Two straight years that the Texans go after uh, or fire their coach. I don't know. But anyways, the Texans, I do feel that they do have a chance at beating the Jacksonville Jaguars. The Jaguars had a little bit of a mishap against the Eagles. That's okay. Only lost by one possession against one of the better teams, if not the best team in the NFL. That's okay. The Jaguars are good. We know that. But if anyone can pull off an upset, it would be the Texans. And I'm just basing this off of So far this season, they have stayed alive in a lot of these games. Like, whenever they're down, they come back, they make it competitive. And the first two weeks or three weeks of the season, they lost all their games by one possession. Last week was the first time that they lost by two possessions, but it was only by 10 points that they lost by. And they were up, like, or they were down by a significant margin, and they would just go back-to-back touchdown drives and keep themselves in the game. So the Texans are always in the game. And against the Jacksonville Jaguars, it's going to be a close one again. So if anyone could pull off the upset, it would be the Houston Texans. So those are two teams that I'm saying could pull off an upset this week, the New York Jets and the Houston Texans. Leave your comments down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on who you think is going to pull off the upset. Uh, But just skimming through all these other games, uh, the Green Bay Packers versus the New York Giants, 3-1 and versus 3-1. and No one really expected that at this point. Uh, and then Thursday night football, the Colts versus Denver Broncos would be a huge blow for that uh, Colts offense. Golly, man, if Jonathan Taylor can't go, that offensive line, we thought it was going to be much better, but it's just, it's not really given any room. I, I, I saw a video, Theo Ash, who has come on the show before, if you guys know who Theo Ash is, uh, he was talking about adjusted line push 
uh, is a stat that the NFL or, you know, one of those next gen stats that they keep up with where it says, Hey, based off of the offensive line performance on each run play, this is how many yards per carry the running back is expected to get. And the Colts are 31 out of 32 in that category. So like Jonathan Taylor is going to struggle because the offensive line is struggling. So it's not looking good. Hopefully they can turn it around. The Chargers and Browns, I think, is going to be a pretty good one. If you remember the Chargers-Browns game from last season, that was a pretty good thriller. Uh, it was in SoFi Stadium, and gosh, the score was like 42-47 or something like that with Baker Mayfield versus Justin Herbert. Um, Lions versus Patriots. Hey, let's give credit to Jared Goff. Guys, can we take a moment to appreciate Jared Goff, like tied for touchdowns? with Lamar Jackson for the season, but he's not getting love because this defense really can't do anything. A lot of Detroit Lions fans are like, Aaron Glenn, get the heck out of here. We need a new defensive coordinator. I don't blame you, man. And then you spent like a top three pick on Jeff Akuda, who, um, again, DK Metcalf kind of insulted <laughs> post game uh, after he took his dump. But yeah, uh, Saints, Seahawks, Geno Smith, I'm giving him credit as well. Has looked great the last two games against the Falcons. Against the Lions, I love the offense moving forward. Rashad Penny, he looked great against the Lions. Like, really, really good. What? Okay, what Rashad Penny does on a per-touch basis is equivalent to what DeAndre Swift does on a per-touch basis. To what J.K. Dobbins does on a per-touch basis. Like, they can make plays getting little amounts of volume. Like, they can make an impact. So, it's scary to think, like, if they get a lot of volume, like, what they can do. But against the Saints, it might be a little bit more difficult for them. Hey, how about my Atlanta Falcons? Two and two. I don't want to jinx it. It's not going to last forever. We're about to go to two and three after this week. Uh, Tennessee versus Washington is going to be a very underrated game. I'm excited for that. Uh, it could either go. It could go either way. I, I feel like it's going to be high scoring uh, with the defenses not really being able to stop anyone at this point. Uh, Eagles versus Cardinals. Cardinals, man. They're, they're getting away. They're 2-2. Two and two. Kyler Murray, like, at the end of the day, has, like, a great stat line, but it just doesn't look like it can't last forever. Like, they're always down. They always come back in this with this deficit that they have, and they sometimes they win, sometimes they lose. And I guess the Eagles, you cannot have a deficit. It's going to be tough, and hopefully it gets better with DeAndre Hopkins comes back and, and Rondell Moore gets a little bit more adjusted in this offense. Uh, Cowboys, Rams, Dak Prescott may come back. I'm not planning on it, but may come back. Michael Gallup is back, which is a huge boost for them. Sunday night football, like I said, whoever wins this game, I feel like is going to be AFC North champions moving forward. I'm giving the edge to the Ravens just because of the schedule. But, you know, I'm going to say if the Ravens win 80% chance that they win the AFC North, if the Ravens lose 60% chance, the Ravens win the AFC North. Uh, and then Monday Night Football. Hey, Josh McDaniels, you realize that uh, Josh Jacobs is a key to your offense. None of this running back by committee approach. No, 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 no. Brandon Bolden, no, 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 no. None of that. None of that. Josh Jacobs is the guy. And if you utilize him, you will win some games. Uh, and then the Chiefs, man, you don't need Tyree Kill. You're getting it done. Patrick Mahomes is looking great. Like, he's one of the few quarterbacks like Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady sometimes where – you don't need the best weapons. And even though your stats may suffer, like you can still win games. And Patrick Mahomes is in that same category. Like it's a very special category to be a part of. Uh, but that is week five. And, and it's filled with lots of games. And hopefully it'll be a good weekend. Uh, but we appreciate you guys watching this episode of Time to Football. Again, subscribe to this channel if you aren't already subscribed. Um, we're in this process of rebranding. We cut out fantasy football completely, and we're just talking about NFL. We're interviewing players as well. Make sure you guys subscribe to this channel, Fantasy Football, if you care about that. Unsubscribe to this channel, because if you're not going to watch any of these videos, it actually helps if you unsubscribe. Unsubscribe to this channel, and then go back to the Fantasy Football channel and watch that. I guess, I mean, if you watch this video all the way through, then you watch this channel. So stay subscribed, I guess. Um, but with all that said, thank you guys so much for watching this episode. And I'll see you next week. Take care.